Hi, welcome to Tinker's Venture, I'm Kai. When comparing shocks, many people like to compress them by hand. It's like kicking tires when you're shopping for a car. Monotube shocks are a lot harder to compress due to the high pressure charge. And many people will associate that with better shocks. Because you've probably seen some videos showing how pressure reduced shock fade. Well, not so fast. Most of those demo videos did not tell a full story. And they leave out a fundamental difference between twin tube and monotube. And this has caused a lot of misconceptions in the community. So in this video, I would like to tell you a full story of twin tube versus monotube. So in the end, you gain a fundamental understanding of shock constructions, why there are different pressures, and exactly what shock fade is all about. Let's get started. First, let's take a big step back and look at the most basic problems these constructions try to solve. As the piston shaft showing in green here enters the shock body, the shaft will take up volume and displace the fluid showing in blue. Fluids are not compressible, so if we fill the shock body with 100% fluid, it will be hydrolocked. It cannot be compressed at all. Therefore, we need some way to reserve space for the fluid to go. So let's start with the odor of the two, the most basic twin tube constructions. For the twin tube shock, we have an inner tube that is the working chamber. And this is where the red piston is working at. The working chamber is filled 100% with fluid. The fluids can go through the bottom base valve, we'll get back to this later, and connect it with the fluids in the outer tube, which is called the reserve chamber. The reserve chamber is only partially filled with fluid, the remaining are gas. And because gas is compressible, this is how we reserve the space for the piston rod. You may naturally assume the volume of the gas should just equal to the total volume of the piston rod. But in reality, you need a little more, because you cannot compress a gas down to zero volume the pressure will go through the roof. In this construction, there's nothing separating the gas and the fluid. If you shake the shock absorber in your hand, it feels like a water bottle because the fluid can flow around. After a lot of motion, the mixing of the gas and fluid can create foaming or aeration, which can cause inconsistent damping. As you can see, the top part of the outer tube is touching only gas. So only the bottom part of the outer tube is radiating heat from the fluid. Therefore, this construction is not ideal for heat dissipation. In comparison, for the monotube design, the fluids and gas live in one single chamber. Because the gas is now spread across a larger cross-section area, it takes up less length along the shock body. Therefore, you have more length along the shock body touching fluid, and it is better for heat dissipation. And most monotube shock you can buy for the Toyota also come with the internal floating piston showing in purple here. And this physically separates the gas from the fluid so they cannot mix. This physical barrier eliminates aeration. However, that does not mean it eliminated shock fade, which we will review more in the next section. For twin tube, there is also design that separate gas from the fluid. In the 4x4 world, some manufacturers use compressible closed cell foam sheet to reserve space for the piston rod. Essentially, the gas that used to floating out here are now captured inside these foam cell sheet. These foam cell sheet are literally just shoved into the outer tube and will get squished down when the piston rod displays fluid. In the streetcar world, people actually use plastic gas bag in place of these foam cell sheets. It is basically the exact same concept, just much less durable. And because all the gas we need is inside the foam, we can fill the rest of the outer tube 100% fluid. For the same size shock, the foam cell technology doesn't necessarily give you more fluid because you still need to reserve the space for the same piston rod. However, the benefit of this is now the entire length of the shock body is in contact with fluid, radiating heat, which in turn keep the shock cool. One key selling point for the monotube shock is for the same outer diameter, we can have a much larger piston. A larger piston had the potential to generate a higher damping force. It also allows finer and more precise tuning. However, we need to put these potential benefits into context. We only realize those potential benefits when our application requires performance damping and our valving is tuned accordingly. But for a lot of regular 4x4 enthusiasts, the smaller piston on your factory twin tube shock may be just enough. One issue you may already see is the gas chamber on the monotube is in the way of piston travel. So as a result, the basic monotube setup has less travel than a twin tube setup. 
But again, this is a generic statement and may not matter for some application. For example, for Toyota IFS, the shock actually have a large top out spacers to limit the shock travel. So a Model 2 shock having less travel doesn't really matter. However, for the rear solid axle suspension, we can easily add more travel with longer shocks. So the travel capability between monotube and twin tube will come into play. And this is one of the reasons to have remote reservoirs for monotube shocks. The gas chamber is now lo no longer in the way of the piston. Therefore, we can have longer shock travel. You might notice I drew a lot more gas in this remote reservoir than this monotube shocks. This is actually how it is and has practical benefits. Now, it is a good segue to the topic of pressure. A key difference on twin tube over the monotube is the damping is controlled at two different locations, a moving pistons and a fixed base valve or foot valve. Usually, the fixed base valve controls only compression and the moving pistons control shock extensions, aka rebound. The piston can also control the combination of rebound and compressions depending on the design. All in all, for twin tube, the moving piston and base valve function in tandem and share the work. Whereas a monotube, all the damping occurs on the moving piston. The internal floating pistons just separate the gas. It does not do any damping because there isn't a fixed compression base valve like the twin tube. The monotube design has a unique challenge. During a compression stroke, the damping force is created by the pressure differentials on each side of the piston. High pressure in front of the pistons and low pressure behind the piston. If the gas chamber is at atmospheric pressure, the high pressure in front of the piston will try to compress the gas chamber further downwards, reducing its volume. And that is in addition to the volume displaced by the piston rod as we discussed earlier. This is essentially trying to expand the volume of the fluid, but the fluid cannot expand. So to take up the volume expansion, either the piston rod got sucked in or vapor bubbles start to form within the fluid and this shock does not have functional compression damping. Therefore, the gas chamber on the Mono 2 shock must be charged with high pressure to counter the high pressure created by the compression stroke. It's kind of like back pressure, if you will. For Toyota trucks, the typical charge pressure is between 150 to 250 PSI above atmosphere. On the other hand, twin tube does not have this pressure requirement because most compression is handled by the base valve and it is fixed in place. Compression damping creates a pressure differentials in the opposite direction. So in reality, twin tube shocks can function even at atmosphere pressure, like this Ironman Phone Cell Pro. Some twin tube shocks also have nitrogen charge to reduce shock fade. More on that in the next section. But the overall pressure is still much lower than a monotube shock. Here's another potential downfall regarding pressure. As the piston rod enters the shock body, it compresses the gas chamber. The pressure will go up and it follows the ideal gas law, PV equals MRT. For the regular monotube, in order to maintain sufficient travel, usually very little gas is used. As a result, the piston rod creates a high percentage change on the gas volume. The pressure will spike up at a high percentage as well. High pressure can put more stress on the seal. It also makes the shock tend to ride firmer. Some manufacturers call this a more responsive performance, but some users may take it as less comfort. It all depends on how you look at it and how it is marketed. And this is why the remote reservoir shock has a large volume of gas, so that it can reduce pressure spikes. Most people may assume the remote reservoir is filled with oil for cooling, but the reality is it is tried to have large volume of gas to reduce pressure spike. It also allows longer shock travel. The better cooling is just a nice side benefit. When we go for a remote reservoir, we can also opt for a compression adjuster, which is another set of compression valving fixed at this location, which is very much like the base valve in twin tube. And because of this additional fixed compression valving, we can indeed run less pressure in the gas chamber. According to ICON's instruction, the non-compression adjuster version is charged to 250 PSI, whereas the compression adjuster version is only to 150 PSI. And more interestingly, some OE manufacturers actually introduced a fixed inline compression base valve back to the monotube shock with the intention to run them at lower pressure. 
They market this as a new technology with improved comfort and service life. I found it pretty amusing how it all comes full circle. Very much like brakes, shock absorbers convert kinetic energy into heat. As they continue to do their work, the temperature will go up. Like brakes can have brake fade, shocks can have shock fade. However, there are a lot of misconceptions about shock fade. So I want to go into the details and explain what causes shock fade exactly. In my opinion, there are three separate root causes. First, as temperature goes up, the viscosity of the shock fluid goes down. Hence, it generates less damping force. This will be a more gradual and predictable change. So some may not even classify this as shock fade, but this force reduction is very real nonetheless. The second root cause is aeration, which is the mixing of gas and fluid as we mentioned previously. Many people think this is all shock fade all about. If we separate the gas from the fluid, such as with IFP or the foam cell, there is zero chance for bubbles to form, therefore eliminating shock fade once and for all. And that is incorrect, because we still have our third root cause, cavitation. We all know water boils at higher temperature in a pressure cooker. And you may also see videos that water boils at room temperature in a vacuum chamber. This is because the boiling point of the water goes hand in hand with a critical pressure called vapor pressure. As mentioned previously, the damping force creates high and low pressure. If the low pressure drops below the vapor pressure, the fluids will boil and form vapor bubbles from within. And if the shock temperature goes up, the vapor pressure goes up with it, making it much easier to cross that line. In addition to boiling, all fluids have some other gas dissolved in them. As pressure decreases or temperature increases, the solubility of those gas goes down, also forming bubbles from within, very much like a soda bottle. To mitigate cavitation, we want to maintain high pressure or low temperature. This is why a lot of shocks have additional nitrogen pressure charge, very much like a pressure cooker or a closed soda bottle. As discussed in the previous section, due to the lack of a compression base valve, the Model 2 shocks need a high pressure charge to begin with. Some manufacturers show how bad cavitation can be when they remove the pressure from the Model 2 shock and suggest this is what's happening in a twin tube shock. Now if I remove the pressure, this will demonstrate what's going on in a hydraulic twin tube damper. When the shock is cavitated, your performance loss is exponential. And that is very misleading information. Twin tube shock will function even at atmosphere pressure. Many twin tube shock are also gas charged to reduce cavitation in severe conditions, and that's extra credit. But in the end, the twin tube shock will still have a lower pressure than the mono tube, all because of the fixed base valve. Another strategy against cavitation is simply keeping the temperature low. So this becomes a heat transfer problem. Just like big brake rotors, simply having more thermal mass will reduce the temperature change for the same amount of energy. Having better heat dissipation mechanism also helps. And this strategy is implemented on the Ironman Phone Cell Pro. It has no additional pressure charge, but it has a ton of mass to absorb those thermal energy. The Phone Cell technology also allows heat dissipations across the entire length of the shock body so that they can keep the temperature down in severe conditions. By running very low pressure, it prolongs service life and improves day-to-day -day comfort. So far, it might sound like I'm vouching for Twin Tube, but I just feel it is not well understood despite being an ancient technology. By no means I try to discredit monotubes. With the larger pistons, these shocks allow the most precise tuning and can achieve the ultimate damping performance. And that is why people who actually race for money all use this monotube. However, for highway driving, fire road expedition, and rock crawling, you don't necessarily need high performance damping. You just need a good match between spring, mass, and damper. The high-end racing construction shocks also come with high maintenance, which I need to do to my Icon coilovers. I will make a video to show my process and what difference it makes before and after. I will also start making technical reviews of different suspension products, so subscribe and stay tuned for those. I hope you learned something new today. Thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next one.